Um, as you know, the Egyptian civilization was around for 3,000 years. The thing that's really kind of spooky about the art is how constant it was. So for example, this statue was uh, commissioned and built about oh, roughly 2,500 BC. It shows a man um, seated as a scribe. In this position, it means the man is a professional scribe. 2,000 years later, we have this statue. It's essentially the same thing. And so it's just incredible how the Egyptian art stayed so very, very constant. We'll take a look at why that's so, and also physically how they managed to maintain that uniformity. And the thing that's really remarkable about, about Egyptian art also is it is so instantly recognizable as Egyptian, as ancient Egypt. You, can't, you really cannot mistake it for art from a different period. So it has this very great allure because it is so very characteristic. It's so recognizable that it's used in a lot of kind of ads. Here's life after burial from Vinny Carbide um, using one of the Tutankhamun objects or even Dr. West toothbrush. And so I have a big collection of this stuff because I think it's just fascinating how Egyptian art shows up in sometimes the most completely incongruous, inappropriate places. But there's something about Egyptian art that resonates with people with a sense of enduring, uh, sense of enduring and, and permanence, and of course being very, very recognizable. Egyptian art, art may also strike the viewer as being very confusing, like what is going on here with the compositions, the arrangement, the symbols. Uh, and so sometimes Egyptian art is, in, is interpreted as being very uh, lofty and very sort of brainy, so it's often imitated but also sometimes people can judge it to be sort of childish. Um, the, the worst side is people say, well, the Egyptian artists didn't really know how to draw. You know, they weren't good artists. They had a very limited repertoire of what they could do. But that's really, that sort of statement is really based on a complete misunderstanding or lack of understanding about what the ancient Egyptian artist was trying to do. It's very important for us to really look at what's going on with Egyptian art. It looks exotic and mysterious because it is the product of a completely different artistic tradition. We in the West are mainly used to a Greco-Roman sort of background for art, particularly the idea of art for aesthetic purposes, of images of people that are actually portraits of people that the image actually re resembles or replicates the physical appearance of somebody. And this is completely unknown with the Egyptian artistic canon. The most basic factor is that the goal of the Egyptian craftsmen was not to make an aesthetic work of art. Rather, the art of ancient Egypt was entirely functional. And this goes back to my lecture this morning, that art is completely a product and byproduct and servant of the religious system. And we'll see how that works. So virtually all examples of Egyptian art are related in some way to the religious cult. And maybe the clearest example of this is the contrast of the mindset uh, of the Egyptian to the Western art. And um, essentially, again, this idea that art is functional within the Egyptian religious system. So for example, statues of individuals, these were created not to be beautiful, although they are very beautiful. You can't discount the aesthetic uh, properties of ancient Egyptian art. But the function of this was, as I mentioned this morning, was to make uh, this person immortal. It's an image of the individual long after his death. It's made out of stone, so it would be preserved. And it would be that person's guarantee of immortality, because people, the living people, would see this and would remember this person. So that is really what these statues are about. These statues, uh, in their earliest period, were created for use in tombs. And then, as we'll see, they gradually migrate out of tombs and people start commissioning statues of themselves to be placed in public areas like in temples. This idea of the uh, functionality of these statues can also be pointed out. As beautiful as these are, many of these early statues were not even really intended to be seen by living people. Many of these were sealed up in these chambers called Serdab. This is in a Old Kingdom tomb. And there's a little slit and the statue would be behind that wall. Sometimes the slit is very, very small. If the slit is thought to be uh, to allow the statue to inhale, for example, incense or different types of offerings that are brought into the tomb. 
And so some of these masterpieces of Egyptian art were essentially not even intended to be seen by living people, which is kind of a funny uh, contradiction because of the whole sense of immortality of the person guaranteed by a statue. Other things that show the symbolism of this art from the time of the Great Pyramid, by the way, there is only one Great Pyramid. So don't say the Great Pyramids. There's only one Great Pyramid. Um, and these are called reserve heads. And these are very, very odd things, as I said, made only during the reign of Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid. And these are, in these are all that was made. It's an extra head. And these were buried in tombs. Uh, the ones that have been found in situ have been bent here. This is the burial shaft. So the, this is the tomb above, the burial shaft, which would have been filled in after the burial. And here's the reserve head. So when the archaeologists first started discovering these, it was very spooky because they'd go down to the shaft and they'd be looking at somebody's face. And the thing that's very odd about these also, we don't entirely understand what these are because all of these also show signs of deliberate mutilation. Usually the ears are chopped off, sometimes there are big gashes across the top of the head. But again, this idea of these beautiful, not really portraits, but likenesses of somebody made for a very specific religious function, even if we're not quite sure what that function was. We also have, of course, these endless scenes of what are called daily life scenes. This is a bunch of kids playing games, uh, including something very interesting called the hut game, kids inside a little enclosure, um, other uh, activities up here. And these, of course, are to immortalize those activities, those sorts of offerings, those sorts of goods forever. These are from the context of the tomb, and so because these are in stone to last forever, whatever is being depicted here would be available to the deceased. And so then we have also these statues. Um, this is an example of a statue that was actually placed in a temple in the later period, states states about 1400 BC. And so these were made to ensure that the person who commissioned this temple, this is a man named Senefer and his wife Senani, they commissioned this to be placed in the temple so they would be forever in the presence of the god. As I mentioned this morning, there are the big processions that are coming in and out of the temples, people saying prayers, people living, uh, giving offerings. And so this would be the surrogate for these two people. So they would, they would be forever in the temple. This is also a very interesting piece because the, uh, there's an inscription that goes down the front and it's completely worn away from thousands and thousands of years. This is from the Karnak temple of people touching the statue. So just wore off the inscriptions. Or statues like this, um, again from a temple context, these show an individual seated with his robe over his knees. Almost all of these, I think these are all for men, not for women. And what it does incidentally is create a nice little, little emplacement for offerings. So these were erected usually in temples. People would come and ideally, if you could read, the literacy rate, again it's a certain odd thing, the literacy rate is probably 2% of the population. Yet, everything is covered with inscriptions because of the potency of these images and also the fact that the person's name is always written there. So you could leave offerings here for the individual to, by proxy, enjoy. There's a, a, a statue like this from the Karnak Temple, which is extremely interesting. It has a, a, an inscription on it, and it says, please leave offerings on my statue, but please clean off my statue because I don't want the food offerings to rot. And so there's this whole sort of cult of maintaining these statues in the Karnak Temple. This, this practice of putting statues in temples was so, so common. When we're, when we're at the Karnak Temple, and we're in the Great Hypostyle Hall, which is this enormous room full of columns, and now it's very, very stark. It's just tourists and big sandstone columns. Originally, that hallway was completely choked with statues. There were tens of thousands of statues in that hallway. And we know that because I think it was in 1903, the French excavating near that particular part of the temple discovered a big pit that had over 17,000 statues in it. What had happened was in the Ptolemaic period, apparently the, the temple was just too full of stuff. They couldn't get the processions through it. So they dug a big hole by the temple, pitched all of the statues in it, and covered them up one of the great discoveries of all time. When we're in Luxor, also when we go to the Luxor Museum, you'll see the remains of another group of these statues. They're called Kashet, these groups of statues, because at the Luxor Temple, a similar group of statues was found 
1994 or something like that. Spectacular. Some of the great uh, masterpieces of Egyptian sculpture that people for hundreds of years had been walking right over the top of. And so the Egyptians, when they were doing some uh, restoration work in the temple, did excavations and all of these statues appeared. And if so, again, the idea being that these statues are representations of individuals who wanted to remain in the temple to approve the blessings. We also have other types of statues. For example, uh, these scribal statues, whenever you see somebody sitting cross-legged again, and here you can see he has a papyrus roll. And the thing that's quite interesting is there's an inscription on the papyrus roll, and it is oriented toward him, not to the viewer. So it's actually supposed to be what he is reading, not what you're reading on his papyrus. Or statues like this, a very unusual type. It's a begging statue, again from the Karnak Temple. This is somebody praying for water, for cool water in the afterlife. And so he has his, man, his hand up to his mouth. There is a very great political uh, function in Egyptian art as well. For example, here from the Temple of Montu, uh, Montu, uh, Montu uh, Hotel at Thebes, we see here uh, Libyan enemies of the king being defeated. Again, this idea of image is reality in ancient Egypt. So the fact that the king has scenes of defeated en enemies guarantees him uh, military success. And this is really kind of odd because it took Egyptologists a while to decipher this because some of these scenes of military success on the part of the Egyptian king are very, very detailed. For example, there's a whole series of these that talk about Libyan campaigns and something like, I forget, 13,006 captives being taken, something like that. That occurs in one king's temple about 2500 BC. Lo and behold, it shows up again 2000 BC, exactly the same number of captives, exactly the same name of the chief of the Libyans, and it shows up several other times. So clearly these are not historical records. These are sort of, I wish this would happen, that these are very powerful, uh, sort of magical ways of ensuring success. And so this is what we're going to see. This is at, at Edfu, not in Luxor, but the classic scene you're going to see shows the king here getting ready to smite enemies of Egypt. It's on both sides of it, this is a pylon. These big gateways are called pylons. And this is an indication showing the king's success over the enemies of Egypt. And sometimes there are very detailed inscriptions, but again, these are absolutely they are um, like icons. These are not historical records. But again, the idea in ancient Egypt, you show something, it makes that come true. Now, since Egyptian art is related to religion, um, I want to just repeat a couple things that I mentioned this morning. The, of course, the belief in life, life after death. If one lived a moral life, you were reborn into the afterlife, into a sort of parallel universe. And just as living people needed food, drink, friendship, I suppose, so did the deceased. And so the continued existence in the afterlife depended upon, of course, the preservation of the mortal remains, because you have to have this anchor for your soul. So of course we have mummification we talked about. So when we, at, when we look at how Egyptian art works within this whole idea, rule number one is a representation of an object could serve as the object depicted. So, for example, a statue is that person. And again, notice the materials. Most of this is stone because they want it to be imperishable. So this is a wonderful statue of a man and his family, his wife to the right, child to the left, um, here from the Brooklyn Museum. So this is their guarantee of eternal life. This idea of the, of the correspondence of the statue to the person, him or herself, is incredibly close. We know from texts that once a statue was made, there was a magic, well, there was a religious ritual that was enacted on the statue. And it's exactly the same ritual that is enacted on mummies. So it actually, it's called the opening of the mouth ceremony. And priests would touch the eyes, nose, and ears of the statue with a particular tool as they're saying prayers. And it makes those faculties of the statue be effective for the deceased. So this, this whole idea of statue and, and individual is very, very close. We also see this in sort of the opposite way. For example, a very famous statue in the Egyptian Museum. And occasionally we see on statues and reliefs deliberate mutilation. Somebody has taken a chisel and has 
attacked her eyes, nose, and mouth. By doing that, they are killing her in the afterlife. They're removing her ability to breathe, eat, and see. And the nose was very important for ancient Egyptians because they, they referred to the breath of life, this wonderful concept, the breath of life. May you give me the breath of life. And so to go after the nose is really, um, we don't know the motivation for this. We have lots of different texts. Uh, is this why the nose on the Sphinx is chopped off? No, probably not. No. And Napoleon didn't do that, by the way. It was already gone in the 16th century. There's a, just to digress, there's a, a, an Arab historian, Makrizi, who talks about that an Arab military guy damaged the nose of the Sphinx, and he was killed by the locals. They were so upset with him for damaging their, their statue. Are there drawings of the, the Sphinx? Not, no. No. <laughs> or, for example, here from Brooklyn Museum, again, the motivation is not clear, but here it's very, very deliberate. You know, just going after the features of somebody with a chisel. Or we have examples like this. Uh, there were two men in ancient Egypt who were deified, be became saints, and can you guess what their occupation was? Scribe. Architects. The two people who are deified, they're both architects, which I think is really appropriate. This is one of them, Amenhotep, son of Hapu. And this is what is called an intercessory statue. He's writing, so he's showing himself as a learned man, as he would have been. And there are inscriptions on it that say, uh, come to me, say your prayers to me, because Amenhotep, son of Hapu, being deified, had a special communication with the gods. So people would come and say their prayers to this statue. There were about 10 of these lined up outside the Karnak temple. I mean, literally almost like a bunch of phone booths for people to come and say their prayers. Also, it's interesting, it's slightly outside the temple because people who didn't have the, the requisite level of purity didn't have to go in the temple. They could just go to the side of the temple and talk to Amenhotep, son of Hapu. But the point with this is, this was attacked and then redone. It's been recarved. All of this was, was attacked and then recarved. Sometimes you'll see with these statues, like a square hole in the middle of the face. That's when it's been damaged, they put a whole new face on it to restore it. So it goes both ways, attacking and restoring. So it's not only the image, you could also kill somebody in the afterlife by attacking the written reference to their name. And we'll see this, I was talking to some people about this uh, this morning, uh, during the time of Akhenaten, Ross was talking about uh, expunging the name of other gods. And we'll see that at Luxor Temple. You look up at the architraves and you'll see all these things have been hammered out and, re and restored. So the belief that representation was as good as the object itself is not limited to people. It works with objects also. For example, here, this is the interior of a coffin. And as I mentioned this morning, these coffins are almost like little houses. And so here, everything that the person wanted was, in the, it was depicted inside the coffin. So here we have a pair of sandals. This is a hand mirror in a fancy case. And then we have uh, bags of natron, bags of natron here. So the representation of these ensured that the person had these in the afterlife. Or here, very commonly in uh, statue bases, little basins for water, representations of food, and uh, the written reference to the types of food that the person wanted. A lot of these are actually, they're called offering menus, and they say exactly what they want in the afterlife. And then usually the text ends with, and every good and pure thing. So it means like the stuff I forgot to mention, just include it. We also can see food offerings ensured in perpetuity by models of people producing food. This is from our collection at the University of Chicago, dating to about 2500 BC. And here a man slaughtering a cow. This was left in a private tomb to actually produce a constant supply of food for the deceased. We also see this idea of a service provided for the deceased by these small statues. And these occur in thousands and thousands and thousands of examples. These are called shabtis or mushebtis, and these are workers for the deceased. So you're dead, you're reborn, you don't want to do any work, because that's the flip side of the coin. You go to a parallel universe, but you might have to do some work, because you don't want to do, because you're retired, you know. <laughs> 
you're reborn, but you're retired. And so by the New Kingdom, there are 365 of these little statues left in the tomb, one for each day of the week, uh, each, each day of the year. The Egyptians had a 365 day year. Um, so you don't tire them out. So each one can do work for you. And these are um, originally agricultural workers, which is why they're carrying hoes. And the, uh, the inscription is Book of the Dead 6, and it says in part, if you want anything to be done, if you want sand from the East Bank to be taken to the West Bank, sand from the West Bank to be taken to the East Bank, I will stand up, I will say, I am here, I will do it. So these make really nice souvenirs, because you can buy replicas of these. Or, you know, it's much better than a kitchen witch. <laughs> and I said, leave them in the kitchen, and I have trouble with my shabtis, or they don't, they're not terribly effective, but it's, it makes a nice little, nice, nice gift. Um, the name shabti also, it's from the ancient Egyptian word usheb, which means answerer, the one who will answer your request for work to be done. We also have seen that uh, not only statues were replicas and guarantors of immortality, but also we have, that's the reason why uh, coffins are usually anthropoid in the form of people, because again, this was a, a guarantee for the person's immortality, that their, even if their mummy, something went wrong with it, the coffin could substitute. And as we saw this morning, things like extra sets of feet were added. Now, a very interesting part of Egyptian art is what these artists were actually doing. And the thing that's most important when you're looking at Egyptian art is to consider their tradition of, of the artist portraying objects, not as they appear from your eye, but they're, what they're doing is portraying the object from the object itself. This is called um, perceptual is what how we do art, because we're perceiving it to be Conceptual is from the object itself, and I'll show you, once I show you some examples, I think this will be much more clear. So with, with this sort of art, objects are portrayed as if in isolation. First of all, there's no perspective, which would be foreshortening, as we do in Western art, because the Egyptians, because these objects that they're depicting were supposed to substitute for whatever they were showing, they wanted to make sure that they were absolutely accurate replicas of what they were showing. So for example, in Western art, if we show a box, we're going to show it kind of as, as a trapezoid as it recedes in the distance. And the Egyptians would say, you can't do that. That's not what a box looks like. A box is either rectangles or squares. You can't do this sort of foreshortening. So each, um, with this sort of art, the most characteristic and essential features of each object were portrayed. Now, to give you an idea, um, this is a scene from the tomb of Rechmere in Luxor. And what they're showing here, of course, are a series of men carrying offerings to the tomb. So these are boxes, or chests rather, and you can see how they're portrayed. They're just shown the front of the box. Of course, in Western art, you would show the front and part of the side. So they don't want to do that because it's not what a box really looks like. So they're showing you the height and width of the box. So that gives you the, the data you need about the box. But the thing that's very interesting is the objects which look as if they are on top of the box, those are inside the box. And the way they do that, the reason they do that is pretty clear. They want to show all of these objects that are being brought to the tomb. In our art, we would show them, they would disappear. Or we'd show the box tipped. And that's not the way the Egyptians do it. So what you're seeing is these objects, you can see each of them is done in correct relative size, so there's no foreshortening. Each object is portrayed from its own, you might say, perspective, not from how you would see it. And so these are wonderful images. For example, this, this is a flexible bead necklace. And it's shown standing straight up because that shows you exactly what that necklace looks like. In our art, it would disappear. It would be flat like that. And so what they're doing is giving you a composite of frontal, uh, bird's eye, all these different views combined to give you the most accurate view of the, each of the objects. This is why the Cubists really loved Egyptian art. Picasso and, and Clay and earlier people just but when they figured this out, they were just all over it. 
because it was the idea of combining different viewpoints to show the characteristic objects. So other things, we have another flexible collar here. This is a, uh, a hand mirror. So all of these objects are supposed to be inside the box, but by showing it this way, they guarantee that each of those objects shown will be available for the deceased forever. So when you start looking at this, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, it makes a lot more sense to do it this way than the way we would do it in Western art. <coughs> Another very nice example here uh, from Gebel Lane, earlier example, and it's gonna be hard for you guys to see, but I love this one. Here we have a donkey with a saddlebag. And so, of course, when we, if we show this, this is the other side of the saddlebag that would be on the other side of the donkey. But here it's shown up in the air because the saddlebag has two sides. So they show it on one side and the other side flipped up to show you that it is a two-sided saddlebag. So again, when you figure this out, it really makes a lot more sense puzzling out what the code is that the Egyptians were using. Another important feature is that usually height in a composition means distance. So for example, in Western art, if you want to show a stack of stuff, the things that are furthest away from the viewer will be smaller. The Egyptians don't do that because that makes things small that are supposed to be large, that they should be all in the same relative scale. And so what they've done here is, for example, this is from the Art Institute of Chicago. This is a table of offerings. These are loaves of bread, which are probably supposed to be lying down on the table. They're like baguettes, tall loaves of bread. And then you see uh, these other offerings. Here's a hunch of a cow, a cow heart, and some vegetables. And they all look like they're floating. But the things above, on the uppermost, are further away from you. So height is distance. You see, if we did this, you wouldn't see the offerings because one would be masked by another. And the Egyptians don't want to mask things because you have to really see what that thing looks like for it to be functional. So again, it, it makes perfect sense when you start, start figuring out what they're trying to do. We also see things very characteristic, for example, the use of baselines. Usually people are very firmly affixed to a baseline. Here we have a guy on a separate baseline, so he's supposed to be much further away. He's coming into the scene holding a haunch, haunch of beef. So an important point in these representations is foreshortening and perspective inherent in Western tradition of, of art was never employed by ancient Egyptian artists because it was thought to distort the essential form of the subject. Well, the question is, why does Egyptian art look so uniform? How can they keep this looking the same? This is done through a series of grid lines that originate around the time of the pyramids. Originally, the plan was that each standing figure of an individual, of a human, was apportioned over an 18, uh, over a grid of 18 squares that are of equal height. So for example, the, um, the head would be, uh, from, the, from the neck to the hairline, would be uh, three squares tall. So then there would be, for example, the ratio of the elbow to the wrist would be X number of squares. So this is uniform. So when they start doing these images put they, on the walls, they first of all, the artist goes in and uh, prepares the wall, smooths it, puts some gesso on it, and then men come in with strings stripped in, uh, uh, dipped in a red ochre pigment, and they snap the strings across the wall in these regular grid patterns. And then they draft out the figures, keeping in mind those specific proportions of each part of the body. That's why Egyptian art is so recognizable, because they're using the system so the proportions are almost always the same. This works for standing figures and seated figures. Um, originally, a standing figure is 18 squares tall. A seated figure is 14 squares tall. This is a steal from the uh, Brooklyn Museum. And here you can see all the grids. This is an unfinished piece. It's wonderful when you get these unfinished pieces. So you can see the grid lines all over this. And it's particularly interesting because you can see the different phases of carving. Well, this is pretty much finished, and this is sort of finished, and this is still very much in, in progress. So that's really the key of the uniformity of Egyptian art. Now, human representations. This is the stuff that people always ask about. Because it's, you know, first of all, 
the Egyptians don't do that. I don't know where that came from, but that is not, you've never seen an Egyptian in a relief looking like, when I say relief, I mean a two, two, um, two dimensional representation. They don't do that. But they do some pretty weird things. Now, just as I was mentioning with that box with the objects, how they're combining different types of views, frontal, profile, uh, lateral, so that's exactly what they're doing with the human form also. The reason they're doing this is to show you the most characteristic view of each part of the body. Because just like with the boxes, these representations of humans have to show you everything. You cannot mask anything. If you mask something, it doesn't exist anymore. And then you've got trouble in the afterlife. <laughs> so when you start looking at something like this, you see... Um, so the, the shoulders are pretty much in frontal view. The head, of course, is in profile. Then the, the figure starts twisting here. It's sort of three quarters. Usually the navel is shown right here. Then the legs are shown in profile. And look at the hands. So what they're doing again is they're combining different viewpoints to make this composite diagram. And once you understand this, it makes perfect sense. Um, and with this sort, this sort of representation, I often get questions because with female figures, they show a v-necked dress, and usually with one breast exposed, the breast is not exposed. They're doing that because this is a frontal representation showing the v-neck dress combined with a side view. They show the woman's breast because that's a characteristic part of the female form. When you see this sort of representation of this garment in two dimensions, it's very clear what's going on. This is from our collection, same dress, deep v-neck, and she's completely covered So it's a v-neck dress. So it's very often, you have to compare two-dimensional and three-dimensional representations to really figure out what's going on. But sometimes it gets kind of spooky. We're trying to figure out, really decode this stuff and see what they're, what they're really doing. So, the, um, so back to Bersha. <coughs> so the, um, the legs are shown laterally. And the reason they do that, of course, is because if you show the legs frontally, it just looks like sticks because you don't get the profile of the calf, you don't get the profile of the knee, and so they show that part of the body in a profile view to really give it the dimension to indicate there is a knee, there is a calf, there is the bend in the back of the ankle. So they're going to avoid views which are usually frontal because that doesn't give you as much information. Um, and for, for example, with, with the face, it's almost always profile with a frontal eye, because in a, in a profile view in Western art, you'd show the eye as a wedge on the side of the face, but the eye is not a wedge shape. It's an almond shape. And so they put the almond shaped eye on the, the profile face, again, combining these views, because they want to preserve what's actually there. <laughs> the face, of course, is shown in profile because it gives you the most information about the appearance of the face. If you show it frontally, it's just an oval disc. So this is what, what they're doing. Um, sometimes the hands and feet are really interesting. Very often, uh, there will be two of the same hand. And that is because, for example, um, actually, maybe the next one is better. Yeah, this is a little bit better from the Art Institute. Here you can see the thumb is on the outside, and the thumb is on the inside here. So it's got two of the same hands. The reason they do that is because in Western art, if, we're sh if you're showing me, you wouldn't see the thumb, unless my hand was like that. But the Egyptians have to show the thumb, because the thumb's an important part of the, of the hand, so they show the hand like this. So you show all the digits and the thumb. So it gets very odd. That the, but once you start recognizing what they're doing, it makes perfect sense. What they're showing you is the most characteristic aspects of the individual. The feet are often very, very interesting. Here you can see um, they usually have two of what is called the, the, the far foot. If I'm being represented, if you're drawing my feet, the foot closest to you, the near foot, you would not see the arch in my foot. You would see the arch in the far foot. But you see in, in Egyptian art, they usually show the arch in both feet. So it's two of the same feet because the arch is a characteristic part of the foot. Now, there is some inconsistency in this. For example, this, this is a great example from our collection of Uha, look at his feet. So very high arches shown in both feet, and a big toe painted white, 
visible on both feet. So he has two of exactly the same feet. This is inconsistent. Uh, by about the time of Tutankhamun, they're starting to do feet in a way that is much more recognizable to us. Here she has the near foot, you can see the toes, and the far foot, so they've differentiated them. But the little tree goddess here has the traditional Egyptian foot. So they're, they're doing different things. So as I mentioned, with the representation of the face, generally they do a profile. Now there are examples of frontal representations here. This uh, flute player, double, double uh, uh, flute player here from a Theban tune, and here also. But you can see, so they, they knew how to do it. Because some people say, oh, the Egyptians are such bad artists, they couldn't figure out how to draw you know, frontal representation. Of course they could do that, but they chose not to do it because of what they were trying to express in art. The question of portraiture is very important because we look at these representations of the Egyptians and we get so much information about them, about the clothing and the hairstyles and what they're doing, and a huge, huge amount of information. But is this really what they look like? It's very difficult to tell because the Egyptians did not do portraiture. Their function with art is to give you a symbolic representation that tells you something about that person but not necessarily what that person looks like. So for example, everybody in ancient Egyptian art looks like they're 20 and buff. <laughs> it's like everybody is hopelessly healthy looking. You almost never see signs of aging. There are a couple famous tombs in Thebes where you see people with gray hair, but it's usually um, like serving people and not the owner of the tomb. So everybody looks perfect. And everybody's dressed in beautiful clothes. Like, imagine trying to move around in a dress like this. It's like, you know, it doesn't happen. So these are representations which are what we call very heavily idealized. They're showing you what they want to look like, not necessarily what they look like. And of course, you know why. Because this is the way that they are going to be in the afterlife. So they're not going to show themselves in an undesirable light. Or, for example, here, King Thutmose of the Third who was in his 50s at the time he died, and I suspect he probably didn't really look as beautiful. But this is one of the most gorgeous pieces of Egyptian art. It is in the Luxor Museum. We'll be seeing it. It's just, it's just heartbreakingly beautiful. Really, really gorgeous. So everybody was eternally slender and, health, and uh, healthy. Now, a thing also about these statues is because they are not portraiture, many of these statues were commissioned uh, without, or excuse me, were, were created without a particular owner in mind, which seems very odd because of the amount of work that goes into these. So the identity of the statue is established not by what the statue looks like, but by incising or writing the name of the individual on that statue. By putting the name on the statue, it becomes that person, whether it looks like that person at all. And we have lots of examples of these statues where the inscriptions don't fit on them right, or uh, even a better example, in our collection, this is our 17-foot-tall statue of Tutankhamun, beautiful piece, you come to Chicago if you go see it. This was excavated at Luxor by us in 1930, the Royal Us, in 1931. Interesting issue with this statue, because the, uh, it had a number of different owners. We think it was commissioned by King Tut, because of the historical uh, circumstances of its discovery. The back pillar of the statue, where the inscription is, has been changed. And this is quite common. So these ovals are called cartouches. You'll be seeing these on the walls of Egyptian temples all over the place. Whenever you see this oval, which means eternity, that encircles the name of a king or a queen. In this statue, here you can see the inscriptions here, which is it's part of his epithets, and it says, of the uh, possessor of happiness, possessor of a strong arm, and then a name. This is the name of King of Horemheb. And here, contrast this part of the stone to this. It's all chopped up through here. So what happened is this statue was commissioned. It was built. It had the name of a king on it. After that king died, his successor chopped out his name, inserted his name. This happened twice because we can see several different palimpsests on this. So there were three different kings who claimed this statue. But the thing that's fascinating is the face was never recarved. They made no effort to change the appearance of the statue because this whole idea of changing the name was sufficient 
to establish that's who this represented. It didn't look like him, but that's who it represented. Um, this idea of portraiture in ancient Egypt, this is, by the way, this is all original pigment on the statue. Um, there are a series of late period statues from being from about uh, 400 BC to 200 BC. And at one point when these were discovered, they were thought to be, ah, the Egyptians are finally getting it. These are portraits. These are, they're finally being influenced enough by the Greeks and Romans that they're finally understanding how to do sculpture. Beautiful, beautiful pieces. Uh, this is, uh, uh, one is in Berlin and the other one's in Boston. But these are not really portraits because what they're doing is they're sort of making icons of age. And what really put the nail in the coffin about these being early portraiture is when some of these statues started to be discovered intact. And it turns out they are entirely Egyptian in nature. Very static, blocky, frontal, back pillars, all of this stuff that is characteristic of Egyptian art. So this is not evidence for portraiture in any way. However, as I alluded to this morning, there is a period in Egyptian art where there is portraiture. And this is in the first and second centuries AD. And this is in the Roman period. And these are these spectacular portraits called Fayum portraits, because many of these were discovered in an area called Fayum, outside of Cairo. And these are the Roman expression of portraits. I mean, these, you could recognize a person from these. I mean, these really look like individuals. And these are the portraits that I mentioned were attached to mummy bundles. So this is where these portraits come from. So during this period, the Romans have adopted the practice of mummification but they have a completely different conception of art. For them, if you do a representation of somebody, it's got to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's the way they think about art, as opposed to the Egyptian artist who would do something like this. It has exactly the same function. This would go over the head and shoulders of a mummy, but this is like a cartoon of somebody. This is not, you know, it doesn't look like a real person. But the thing that's very interesting, these are, these are exactly contemporary. These are made in exactly the same time period for exactly the same purpose, but they're made for different clients, for different people of different backgrounds. So we have uh, mummification workshops who are doing this style for the Egyptians, and we have other workshops who are doing the portraits for people from a Greco-Roman background. That real gold leaf? That's real gold leaf. This is in the, in the Brooklyn Museum. It's a spectacular piece. And here you can see Osiris, the god of the, of the afterlife. Really a lovely piece. <coughs> so, so what the Egyptian artist was doing, as I mentioned, was not trying to make a portrait of somebody. They're doing a symbolic image that tell, told you something about the person. So for example, here again, this piece from the Brooklyn Museum of a man and his family. Um, very important, this uh, representation of the little boy naked, children are shown without clothing, his finger to his mouth, which is the iconic representation of a child who is sucking their, their, their finger. And so here we have, uh, it's clear that this is the important figure because he's larger. He commissioned the statue, so he's larger, but it shows him within a family group. Uh, also, some interesting little features. You know, all of this hair, the Egyptians love big hair, and they're doing this with wigs. Nobody has hair like this. And so here you can see the woman with her wig. This is her real bangs on her forehead. And she's got the wig over her, and this, this of course, is a wig. Or here, the statue, again, from our collection, very, very common that the skin of men is painted kind of terracotta red, and women are painted yellow. And this is an encoding, this is symbolic, that supposedly this family is well off enough that the woman does not have to work outdoors, is what we think is going on here. The man is a more active one. Usually men are showing, stepping forward with, oops, with one foot, as here. Women are usually shown with their feet together. Yeah, and this is kind of interesting because it shows women as being passive, much more passive than men. But this is the only culture in the ancient world, and until recently, one of the only cultures anywhere, that women had exactly the same legal rights as men. It's a very interesting culture. Women could buy and sell property. They could they could divorce they could, if they didn't like their husbands. They could disinherit their kids if their kids weren't nice to them. Women were big economic 
they have big economic stakes in this in this um, society. So it's kind of interesting that they're shown as shrinking violets, you know, in these in these statues. But they're what, what again the artist is trying to show you is first of all these people are well off enough to have these fancy clothes. They're in beautiful condition, and the fact that he is um, the leader of the household and she's the passive member of the household. Or things like this, uh, I love this. This is what the artist is trying to do here is to show you, first of all, that this man is an educated man because he's shown as a scribe with the papyrus on his lap. But he's also shown as being very, very affluent. And what would give you that idea? Well, they have the papyrus. Well, the rolls of fat. Notice he's slender, but then they put all these rolls of fat on a slender torso which indicates that he is well off enough that he was well nourished, you'd say. But they do this concession because they don't want to look fat, but they want to show you that they could afford to basically overeat. And so again, these are the symbols that are being sent by these statues. Well, I hope that this discussion has given you a little bit more appreciation of what the ancient Egyptian craftsman was attempting to do. Rather than being simply masterpieces of Egyptian art, for example, here is a, a workman shown as being a workman because he has his tools. Um, the, the, these, each of these countless representations from Egypt are really uh, functional within the society and part of the religious uh, background of the society. This is what you can for Tari. So thank you very much. Oh, one last thing I want to point out is also the symbolism of this. If you can't read hieroglyphs, you probably have no idea what's going on in this, in this scene. Because the Egyptians love to embed hieroglyphs in scenes because hieroglyphs are little pictures of things. So what we have here, this is the hieroglyphic writing for linen. So she's presenting a tray of linen to the god Ta. So this is, they love this, they have a great sense of humor about how they're doing this. And this is another tray of linen, but this is also um, incense. So it's, again, they're embedding hieroglyphic writing into these overall scenes, which is really, really kind of, kind of cool. So thank you very much. Is that a question? I do. What about the artists themselves? Oh, Did they design their work? Was one more predominant or famous? Good or? question. Good question. Um, artists are almost all anonymous oh. in ancient. There are about two pieces that are signed, and a lot of this has to do with the way the artists worked. They worked in big workshops. They were very, very specialized. So for example, one guy would be assigned um, the roughing out of a statue, another guy would do the finer work, the next guy would do finer work, a guy would do the polishing, a guy would do the painting, a guy would do the inscriptions. And so by doing that, you rarely have the opportunity for an artist to put his individual stamp on anything. So a combination of this sort of assembly line uh, joined with the use of grids for uniformity is first of all why it is so uniform. It's also why we have almost no signed art from ancient Egypt. That doesn't mean that the craftsmen were unimportant. The craftsmen were very, very well regarded in ancient Egypt. These guys were uh, highly compensated. Uh, we have lots of records about these guys. For example, a couple of you have been reading books about Daryl Medina, which is the uh, village where the, men, the workmen lived who were building the royal tombs. And there we have all this information. So a guy who specializes in making coffins, let's say, he's going to trade a coffin to the guy who's a specialist in making statues. So the, you've got this high level exchange between the artists themselves, because these guys are very much in demand for their services. In fact, at Daryl Medina, this company town, their job was to just do the art. So they had this big support crew that was doing the cooking, bringing the water, doing all the stuff just to let these guys do their art. So they were, artists were very highly regarded. Yeah, I believe you mentioned that uh, two architects were deified. What were their names and why were they special? Um, it, yes, there were two architects, there were two men in ancient Egypt who were deified. Uh, both architects, one is Amenhotep son of Hapu, who was the architect for uh, Amenhotep III, who's one of the great builder pharaohs. You're going to see his, his stuff all over Luxor. He was he designed the, the Luxor temple and a whole bunch of absolutely spectacular stuff. So he was a very, very famous architect. The other one is Amenhotep, is, um, is Imhotep, which you might have heard of. Imhotep is associated with doctors now. He's a, a god of healing, but he was an architect. He was probably the architect for the step pyramid enclosure, the earliest pyramid enclosure. 
So these men were renowned for their uh, for the, the works that they designed. Now, why they were deified, we don't quite know, because Amenhotep, son of Hapu, from about let's roughly 1300 BC, he was deified very soon after his death, and actually Imhotep was too. And these two saints considered continue to be venerated up into the Roman period. Um, the Hatshepsut temple that some of you have been asking about in the Greco-Roman period, the sanctuary of that that used to be where, where Amun would live, was taken over as a uh, healing sanctuary where both Amenhotep, son of Hapu, and Imhotep are shown. People would go into that sanctuary and spend the night, and, and um, they would uh, have dreams and incubate dreams about these two saints coming to save them. There are some other people who are deified also. It's kind of interesting. There was a cult called the Hezi. The Hezi are people who drowned. People who drowned had a special kind of status in Egyptian religion. Um, have any of you been to the Metropolitan Mu Museum of Art and seen the Temple of Dendur? That is dedicated to two guys who drowned. So they built a whole temple for these guys. They drowned, drowned in the Nile. Give me one more question in the, in the very back. I think the question is the career path of, of these architects. We don't really know. They, they're famous architects. They must have come up through the ranks somehow, but we don't know. We don't know very much about their training. But they had a very, they were revered by their, that reigning pharaoh who advanced these men to you know, tremendous heights because of their trust in these men's uh, abilities to, to build. When you go, you know, when we're in Egypt, you know, what you're going to see is just going to knock your, your socks off because these enormous, enormous limestone and sandstone structures um, that are thousands and thousands of years old and they're still there. The Egyptians were very good builders. But it's, it's very interesting because you can see good building technique and really crummy building technique in, in Luxor when you get a chance I'll point out some of the big building errors. Um, there are sections at Karnak that they undermine something and the thing collapsed and they had to rebuild it. And it's, it's really interesting how, how they also, the artists when they're carving the walls, sure, they're going to make goofs. And so you're going to see patches. If they made a really big goof, they just cut it out and stick a piece of stone in. If it's a small goof, they cover it with plaster and recarve the seam. But then what happens very often is over the years, the plaster falls off and you get this really interesting thing where it's about two arms because the original arm was in the wrong position. They plastered over and they do the arm like this and then you end up with these, it looks like a stop action film because you have both versions. Of, so when you see things like that that don't, don't make sense, it's probably recarving because they made, they made a mistake and they made plenty of mistakes. But they had easy ways of fixing it. Yeah, one more question. In front. Were there many female artists? Were there female artists? Good question. Uh, no. I don't think there are any that we know of. Um, there were few, uh, few female scribes, which is different. In fact, in fact, one of the deities of, of uh, writing is Sheshat, who's a woman, which is kind of interesting because female literacy was, was quite low. Um, women were involved in crafts, like weaving and that sort of thing, but I don't, I can't think of any examples of female like sculptors. But again, a problem is. Nothing is signed. The reason we know these people are artists is because for in their, for example, in their tomb, these tombs we're going to see, they have not only their personal name, but it's very important in ancient Egypt to record what your job was. So we know that this guy, oh, he's a sculptor. He's a Ganuti is the word. So he's a Ganuti in, in Hotep or something like that. So um, because the Egyptians had to record their personal name because this idea of immortality, which is an egocentric kind of immortality and, and commemoration, but they immortalize themselves within the fabric of society by always saying what their job description is. And this is, this is incredibly helpful and valuable to Egyptologists because, for example, the name um, Amenhotep, which means Amun is satisfied, all these names mean something. There are about a billion Amenhoteps in ancient Egypt. So if, you, if somebody brings me an object and it's inscribed for Amenhotep, if it doesn't have this job description, it's like, you know, I can't help you with this. But very often, the guy will have very, some very distinctive title, and then I can match it up 
to, oh, that's the Amenhotep that's in the Leiden Museum, and his stuff is blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's the, the titles. And these guys were really, really scrupulous about writing this down. Some of the more interesting autobiographical inscriptions we have talk about um, these career paths. They talk about, well, I was a kid, I was brought up here, and I went to school, and then I got this job, and then I, I was so excellent that I was promoted to this job, and then after 12 years, oh, I was so good, I was promoted to this job. So you can see how these people, some of these people move up through the ranks. A lot of nepotism, huge amount of nepotism. Very often, your son ends up with the job that you had. So thank you very much. Now it could be nap time, but I'm happy to answer questions personally. <laughs>